That video caught my attention because the majority of my life I was a strong starter. And as soon as um, tests came along or things didn't quite go my way or, um, you know, the excitement was gone. And, 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 I, and I look at that also as we're involved with this 10 for 10 challenge. Um, you know, the key is, I heard it last night uh, from a powerful woman of God is, if we haven't seen each other for two years, I should be at a higher level than the last time you saw me. I shouldn't be in the same place. Because with God, there are no limits. You know, we put limits on Him. I, I shouldn't be as angry as I was, was. I shouldn't be resentful still at you. And it's so important to understand that God has more, but it, it, it's for those who are willing to run the race. And if you really look at the word, you know, to win the prize, what is the prize? I mean, we can say we get to go to heaven. That's unbelievably awesome. But I want to get whatever God has for me on earth. I don't think he sacrificed what he sacrificed for me and you just to endure earth. He freed us to be a source to help through his power to free other people. When I look at 10 minutes a day with him, when I look at 10 hours a month, when I look at, you know, giving God what he has given me, and, and, that, and I love it when I'm not the only person that has to speak the truth. Because one I thing I've known about the truth, and sometimes it hurts. She put hundreds of people in check last night and she said, you think you're good at what you do because of you? You're good at what you do because of what God gave you. And if you're good at what you do for, because of what God gave you and you're like a reservoir versus a river and not giving back to him, who are you? More importantly, whose are you? Are you your own or are you his? That women's conference was so powerful in, in a sense being bought with a price, and I don't even understand myself what that really means, what Jesus had to go through to, 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 to purchase me. I was nothing nice. What it cost him to get a guy like me and a person like you, and then just like Pastor said earlier, for the, those who don't think they have any questions at all, that think they got this whole thing just figured out, it's not the case. When you think you got it, you just miss it. The book of Galatians says, be careful when you think you're standing firm. That you don't fall. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that pride goes before destruction. What did he have to pay when he paid for me? And more importantly, what is it costing me? What am I willing to to pay. See, I mean, you hear me say this often, you know, I mean, there was a time in my life that, that I had to live off handouts. But if you're still living on handouts and you believe in Jesus and you haven't utilized the provision that he died and rose again for you, he wants you to be the one that's handing out. I mean, I'm not here. He, he, you know, I received the handouts, but then because of his favor, his grace, he came so we cannot just have a life, the Amplified Bible says, that you may enjoy your life and have it in abundance, not just to the full, but until it overflows. Something in order to overflow from you, you can't take. You've got to learn how to give. God will give it to you so you can give it away. But if you were still in the process of taking handouts and showing up, what's in it for me, what's in it for me, that ain't God. What am I willing to pay for the price that he paid? And, and that son, Lord, I thank you for a beautiful spring day. Amen. Lord, I ask that you do a mighty work here. Change this atmosphere of confusion and perspective perspectives off and people distracted right now in the name of Jesus that they may be able to be present here tonight. Not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. Lord, that their ears may be spiritual and their eyes may be spiritual. Lord, that you will do a supernatural transformation in their heart and mind. Lord, that things will fall off them tonight in the name of Jesus that have been holding them back. Lord, I ask, that you, I ask for forgiveness if there's anything in my thought or my actions that's not of you. I receive the purification in Jesus' name. That I might stand here as a pure vessel to be used by you and you only. None of me and all of you that you may speak through my vocal cords. In your name we pray, amen.
So a recap of the first seven days, it says the cure for the ache of the ordinary was the, the preface, preface, whatever. <laughs> the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night last night and I couldn't get back to sleep and I, was, I studied before I went to sleep. Pastor Jason and Ellen, Ellen brought me some meatballs at about 11.30 last night. <laughs> Those were good, thank you, Ellen. See, it's good when people look out for you. It's a blessing, and, 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 and I had that in my spirit, and, and I went to sleep, and I woke up, and I, I started to, you know, just heavily on my heart, the ache of the ordinary. But it was, what, what God had put in my heart wasn't so much of the ache of the ordinary. It was so that so many of us want to be ordinary. So many of us have, have wondered why we're not as normal as the other people. So many of us have, 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 I just want to be like them. God didn't create you to be like them. God didn't create you to be ordinary. He didn't, he didn't create you for nothing but just to be a person that stand up. So whoever it was that was up last night at around 1 o'clock wishing they were somebody different than they are, God says, no, I made you exactly the way I wanted you to be. Amen. Whoever you are under the sound of my voice. Because I couldn't go to, go to bed until I, I had to pray for you. And I don't know who you are. But you were up last night wishing you were a different person than God created you to be. And it says the ache of the ordinary, the prayer that stopped the sun. See, we have to ask ourselves, what did God have to stop? I mean, God stopped this pain. God stopped this hurt. God stopped this anger. God stopped this fear. Stopped this anxiety. God stopped these things so I can start serving you. See, a lot of us try to stop it ourselves, and, and I love that day, too, when it talked about that. Because, like I said earlier, if you're in the same place that you were, God's got a different plan. And you're page 23 vision. What is your personal vision? What does God have for you? Ignite the ordinary. We did that as we ignited our candles last week. What is your vision worth to you? See, if I was bought with a price, I, I got to be worth something. And, 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 and my vision and, and this church's vision has to cost me something. It blows my mind as I see families write checks for the 10 to 10. And if they didn't write those checks, they could buy a $300,000 house. Some of you guys are giving to the point where you could buy a If you didn't give, you could go buy a Mercedes. That, that blows my mind. It blows my mind. Like, okay, yeah. And, and then those people who do not have the money think that the people that do have the money can afford to get. No, they can't. We almost bounced two checks this week. But I can't afford not to. I can't afford not to. So I commend those people. But your vision has to cost you something. If it doesn't cost you something, it has no value. It has no value. It says seize the vision. We need to learn how to maximize our moments. Sanctify naivete, right? God uses a bunch of nobodies. See, I was naive enough to start, help start a church not having a clue. What are, I mean, I mean and you don't always have to be the visionary. You can, if you can get behind Kylie, you can get all the benefits that he has by hitting the streets and loving people. And it talks about seizing the vision, sanctified. It says, give me my rocks. I, I ended the service last week. I mean, be you. God created you to be you. And if you're not being you, you're, it's, it's a difficult life. And I can speak from, from di you know, different experiences that I had for 30-some years on this planet trying to figure out how not to be me. Because I wanted to be ordinary, but never did I know that God had a plan for my life. Day 8 talked about God is bigger. It says... In the car, the guy started screaming at me at unbiblical how I had been in the sermon I had preached at church. Isn't it something that people want to argue about church too? You will know them by their fruit, not by their opinions. You need to understand that there's a reason why that guy was picking pastor up at the church and he wasn't a pastor getting picked up at the church. I don't know anywhere in the Word of God where it says, I am sent to challenge the... Pa now, don't get all tripped out. I'm not talking about any of you. <laughs> but I've seen that in so many churches where somebody wants to give the pastor a piece of their mind. I don't want a piece of your mind. I've got enough problems myself. 
But it's so important to understand that, that that's, I mean, here's this guy, as it talked about, I mean, he's, and it says, I had told a story in my sermon on how my dad had liver cancer and how he had been praying that God would heal him. But even if my pa- father wasn't healed, I'd said, we would still trust God. See, a lot of us have a hard time trusting God today because things didn't turn out as we wanted them to turn out. Tonight at the end of the service, we're going to be talking about mountains, but as I've prayed for several people over the last 10 years, and I ask them to move, ask God to move the mountains out of their lives, sometimes the circumstances change, but your perspective on the circumstance does. And sometimes that's enough of a mountain to move for you to have a better life. See, I think a lot of time our trust in God, it, it depends on, how, we, we almost like we play God. And, you know, we know better than God. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Of course we should pray boldly for what we think is best. That is the heart of the sun stand still experience. Like I said with tithe and offering, you know, I think our hearts are right, but our minds get in the way. The devil attacks us in our mind, so, you know, God wants to get to our heart. That's where we accept, and it says, but let enough humility to realize that sometimes God's will is not going to be the same as what we expect, when or how. See, that's where a lot of us get tripped up to, you know, this isn't what I expected. It didn't happen when I wanted it to happen, and it didn't happen how I wanted it to happen. Well, we have audacious faith for ultimately is God's plan. Now, there are, how many people in the sanctuary tonight are grateful that their plans didn't work out? Hallelujah. I'm grateful for unanswered prayers tonight. Because when I, when I reflect back on my life, when my plans didn't work out and His purpose prevailed, that's why we sit here this evening. So we've got to recognize, as the Bible says in Isaiah 55, 9, do you believe God's way is better than yours? As as the heavens are higher than the earth. Babe, come up here for a second. See, if my wife is sitting right here and she looks out towards you, she can only see so far, but if I'm up here, my ways are higher than hers. And if she's looking at life from that perspective and having to see through the crowd versus God's looking at life through this perspective and can see things differently than you can see them. See, my wife has limited view right now, but when God is elevated, and God's already elevated, but you have to elevate Him. Is God holy Lord? (laughs) I said, holy Lord, relax. (laughs) But do you believe that God's ways are higher than yours. It says, so are my ways higher than your ways? Are my thoughts higher than your thoughts? See, my life, I I like to override God's thoughts. And i got to say, as it says in day nine, the perhaps paradox. In today's reading, the army of King Saul has been locked at a standoff. You hear me say it, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. What are you you locked in tonight in a standoff? What is it that you're trying to figure out that only God can figure out? What is it that that God is calling you to release into him? It says, and Jonathan, the king's son, had become so aggravated with the inaction of his fellow warriors. I've been in ministry 10 years. That's why the Bible says the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It doesn't matter how many are with you. As long as God told you to do it, the battle and the victory is yours. Quit looking around and comparing yourselves amongst yourselves. The Bible says that isn't what. God can do mighty things with just you. But Jonathan was getting aggravated and frustrated. I mean, my flesh gets in the way when I look at that graph and that chart. I'm like, what are the people doing? But it ain't going to be the people that do this. It's going to be God that does this. We got to understand that God always in his grace makes up. And that's what Jonathan is talking about here. You know, and, and it goes on to say it's so important. He got aggravated in the inaction of his fellow warriors that he decides to make a bold move. I've been making bold moves for 10 years. Bold moves that people didn't understand. Bold moves that people didn't back up. Bold moves that only two to three men walked behind me. Don't get discouraged when people walk away with you. You're, you're not the, when you're walking with the Lord, friends will leave you. Just like they did with Jesus. And it it says right here, it's so important. Audacity is the believing that God's promise is bigger than my perhaps. See, believing means, believing is your faith. And your faith, as the Bible says, faith without works is dead. 
It says the Bible says in God's word is a lamp onto our feet, not a floodlight beaming towards our destination. See, we've got to learn if we can't enjoy the journey, we will not appreciate the destination. Because once you get to whatever destination you got your eyes set on, there's going to be another destination. It, God, it's never ending. The, the, the destiny, he's got so many things for us. He just wants to see to us, and are we worth what he paid for? He must think we are because he bought us. Some of us said, I ain't going to belong to no man. I be if you want to belong to something, wouldn't it want to be God? It's so important that we grasp what it's saying here. See, I don't want to be around frady cat Christians. The Bible says that God's word is a lamp to our feet, not a floodlight to our beaming towards our destination. So armed with the confidence that the decent chance and an interesting possibility that my impulse might be from God, perhaps in order words, I start investigating. That's what we're doing right now with this new church home. I'm not saying, oh God, drop it out of the sky into my lap. What should I do, Lord? What should I do? That's not how it works. It says, we'd all like to live in a world where God lets us do big things that require minimal risk. We're worth to put everything we've ever worked for on the line for God. And there's other people that are willing to do that too. And that's truly what God is calling if that's what he's asking you to do. The fact is, though, that the land where the sun stands still is the land where promise and perhaps must coexist. Audacious faith does not eliminate doubt and fear. It eclipses their power one decision at a time. See, God covers the doubt and fear. You need to learn how to, I need to learn how to operate in spite of my fear, in spite of my doubt. I can't get into analysis Paralysis. Should I stay or should I go? What do you want me to do, Lord? You know, even if God had a lightning bolt come out of the sky, go here. I probably still wouldn't go back in the day. Are you sure that was God? Because we come up with those things. And it says now in 1 Samuel 14, 6, are you standing still because you're in, in doubt? It says, let's go across. Let's go means let's get busy. Across to the outposts of those pagans, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, just one other person he took with him. One other person. It was, it was my wife and I back in the day with this church. And then God brought in more people and he continues to do it. It says, perhaps the Lord will help us for nothing can hinder the Lord. When you're, when you're, when you're an ambassador for Jesus, you've got to understand that nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or just a few. And the key is that obedience. Day 10, between the promise and the payoff. See, it's very, very important, church, that you understand that God is not preparing a blessing for you. Let me say that again. That God is not preparing a blessing for you. He's preparing you for the blessing. How many were got blessed and couldn't handle it? And the blessing turned into a curse. See, the difference between the promise and the payoff is Galatians 6. It says, do not become weary in doing good at a proper time. You'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. But it's so important. It says, every big dream has small beginnings. You should have seen this church when it started. Remember, Allison? We had two couple gals. I think my wife was even on the praise. It was a disaster. <laughs> If I would have been up there. But it's so important that everything starts with a small beginning. Every tree has a seed once upon a time which starts an inspiration in your imagination. The people who do big things for God are the ones who have the perspective to see the potential in small beginnings. They refuse to stop nurturing. I ran into a gal that used to nurture me 10 years ago. And she says, I watch how you nurture. We were over at this women's crowd. You go up to all the people and you hug them. Very few pastors do that. You nurture your flock. I'm like, I got a flock? <laughs> We're in this together. I mean, I want to feel loved. I want to feel nurtured. I want to feel cared for. And that's what this family does for me. And it says, see it until it's full grown. But what does that really mean? What is the destination? Is it the next property that God will have for us? I think that's just the start of what he's going to do for us. And that's really when the work starts. 
You know, you look at the college graduates. Uh, Steph's boyfriend was over at the house this week. He just got hired at a nice financial firm. And, you know, he just got done with college. He just got his first job at a financial. But now the work starts. And we've got to understand that we've got to really recognize that God can do mighty things in and through us. Embrace the reality between the promise and the payoff. There's always a process. Without the process, there is no progress. But the process is usually filled with pain. See, I mean, Ellen had to go through some pain to birth Maya. In order to get birth, there's going to be pain. And if you've got to understand it, you've got to learn how to process the process. That's why God gives you shepherds and mentors to help you out. I don't know how to process the process. You probably won't make it to the promised land. That's why audacious faith is so vital. It's as vital as air and water. It redirects your attention from the right now to what you believe will be one day. It ensures don't give up in the meantime before you ever get to dream become your own. See, you can have one reality with two people with two different perspectives. Same reality, and her and I can have two different perspectives about it. The reality is God brought, bought you for a price. The reality is that he said that you can enjoy, have a life to the full until it overflows. The reality is what he says that when he begins something in you, he will complete it. The reality says that he's got a future and a hope to you. The reality of God is the measure you use will be measured to you. The reality of God says do not worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. The reality of God that the rest of your life can be the best of your life. The reality of God is that you are forgiven as far as the east to the west. But what's the reality of you? Are your thoughts higher than God's thoughts about you? Why would you trump God when he says you're a champ and you say you're a chump? Why would you let that neighbor tell you who they think you are versus God telling you who he thinks you are? Amen. You are a child of God bought with a price, with a magnificent plan that only you can accomplish. But the thing is that he needs your participation. He needs your participation. And that's what he's saying here. He says, it's so vital, it redirects your attention. Before dreams become for first Kings 18, 43. Do you have enough faith to stick with it? Do we have enough faith to stick with the 10 for 10 for 10 months? Can you imagine what your life would look like today if you just would have stuck with it? If you just would have stayed with God years ago, where would you be? And I don't say that to shame or guilt you. I say that since you're here. Stick with it. It says, go look towards the sea, he says. He told the servant, and he went. See, I love people that are servants say, go look. They said, where do you want me to look? Why do you want me to look? How long do I have to look? Where do I have to look? How long do we have to do this? And then they pull out their text. I mean, I saw, whatever. <laughs> I'm so, like, you're so busy. <laughs> but check out his servant here. He says, go look. And the servant comes back. There's nothing there. He said, go look again. Seven times he said, go look. And that guy just kept looking. Because he didn't quit. And quitters never win. He had a man of God in his life that told him to go look. And he kept looking. He said the seventh time, say seven. Seven. Say it again. Seven. The seventh time the serpent, servant reported, a cloud as small as my man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go tell him, hitch up your chariot and go down. See, and, until something stops you. But here's how we do church. Yay, rah, rah, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I'm a champion, I'm not a chump. I'm forgiven as far as the east to the west. And as soon as we hit this back door, something stops us. It doesn't have to be like that. You can take God wherever you go. He's not just around you. He's in you. His thoughts are higher 
in your thoughts, but we, we have people that, 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 that really teach us, as Elijah was one of those great teachers. It says in day 11, your mistake into a miracle, nothing you have done is so repulsive. Who's done some repulsive things? See, we let the devil tell us that's so repulsive, God can't use you now. That God can't redeem your potential and love you through it. See, you know what I feel about that word potential? That when you were born, God put a seed of potential in you. But it will only be a seed of potential unless it comes out of you. And it's so important that we grasp it and say that God will love you through it and his people will love you through it. But you have to face up to your wrongdoing before you can truly put it behind you. Get honest with your failure. Assess the damage. See, it's not just damaging you, and it might not just be damaging the people, person you did it to. It might have damaged a lot of people. And it says assess that damage that sin had caused. Stop making excuses. Don't even try to play off the pain. Get it into the open. See, there was something that went on with Doug years ago, and then, and then you know, the same stuff went on with me, and we, we, we fell. And then the chatter starts. No matter what, you can't stop the chatter because people are waiting for you to fall. They get happy when you fall. Don't get around those people. So they were saying this, they were saying that, and I, I pulled Doug right up on the stage. I said, this is exactly what happened. Has anybody got anything to say? Put it out in the open. Get real with it. You might have made a mistake, but you're not a mistake. We all make mistakes. We all will make more mistakes. If you have somebody judging you because of your mistakes, they don't think they've made any? It says in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, it says you have to repent and, and get, get, you have to repent of it to get released from it. If you claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves in the truth. See, have you ever met anybody that they're the president of their own fan club? <laughs> Mr. Perfect? Can't tell them nothing. All of it, but then they have nothing but negative to say about everybody else. And, and, and you know, holier than the now, and, and, and you know, self-proclaimed geniuses. Even Jesus had to be pointed out. John pointed Jesus out before he baptized him. Maybe your job is just to point out the man. We, there's only one Joshua, there's only one Paul. I mean, I mean, whatever God has for you, and this is what I do before I preach and do anything in life. I say, I confess my sin. He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's enough stuff that can happen in an hour or a day that will contaminate this mind, will make me not purified. And if I don't get the purification here, I'm going to be doing some crazy things out there. Asking God for forgiveness and purification isn't a one-time event. If you live in the same world I do, you should do it several times a day. The only one that's perfect is God. And it says now in, in day 12, expect the best. I mean, you get what you expect. The problem is that it misunderstands the nature of expectation. Expectation is faith. He says your expectation is the belief that you, you, what you're hoping for <coughs> will actually happen, not your backup plan to take care of it if it doesn't. Again, look at the times that you didn't trust God, so you intervened on God's behalf because you thought your thoughts and your ways were higher than His. And can you imagine how it would have turned out if you would have just waited? You can't hope for God's best while believing the worst. It says, but that's not what's going on in Peter's mind. Peter, at least for the first, expects the best. Since Jesus calls him out of the boat, well, then Peter apparently thinks he is able to go with him walking on the waves. See, God is calling you to walk in the waves of life. It's not really guaranteed. It says, now it's true that in just a moment, his fear will get the better of him. His faith will cease holding him up, and he will earn a rebuke from the Lord because of it, as he says, ye have little faith. But let's give him the props, at least for a little while, he really believes that he can walk on water and he does it. Can you imagine what your life would look like if you just stayed in the water? If you wouldn't keep, you know, just like it says, you're focusing on the storm instead of Jesus. 
Initially his eye was on Jesus, and then it got on the waves and the storm, and that happens so often in life. It says, Jesus is calling you today, come to me. He says, come towards your future I have for you and expect the best, hope for the best, accept what God loves, give him the glory. See, I wonder if God wonders if he really blessed you, would he get the glory or would you get the glory? Is God holding back a blessing from you because you're the president of your own fan club. I'll never forget, I, I, I met a multi-millionaire one day, and he, she's a man of faith, and he, he, just, he just got out of a big merger deal, and he was going down the elevator with his attorney, and he looked at his attorney, and he says, look what I've done. Within a year, he lost everything. Would God get the glory if he gave you more? Would God get the glory? Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me. See, sometimes in life God is trying to tell you something. Everybody else can see it but you. He's telling Peter... Come, Peter. And now some of us are, 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 are Peter and we look, are you talking to me? He's talking to you. He's talking to you. He says, come. See, I love talking to Sam. Sam's got zest like me. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, I mean, get, get, get out of the boat and stay out of the boat. God hasn't called you to be comfortable. He's called you out into the uncertainty. Because then you need to trust him there. When you're comfortable, you just trust yourself. It is so important, as it says in day 13, it says spontaneous obedience. Have you ever noticed that some of the biggest opportunities in life came at the time in a way you don't expect? Yes, in 2012. Oh, you're going to start a church. What? Business was going great. Marriage was great. Ministry was growing. I ain't got time for a church. I forgot the price he paid for me. I forgot what, what he had did for me. And, and, it's so many, and not only that, but our response we need to make to those opportunities is often simple step. What do you feel that God is calling you to do today? Ask yourself, why not? The sooner you step into the water, the sooner you can go on your way rejoicing. Acts 8.36. It's time to act on what God is prompting you to do. There's nothing worse in life than a missed opportunity. When the Bible says, give as I put it in your heart to do, I ask myself, the people that don't do that, what else are they not doing that God prompts them to do? What is God prompting you to do? And it's so important that we grasp it says in Acts 8.36, it's time to act on what God is prompting you to do. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. Unit said, look, here's the water. Why, what can it stand in my way of being baptized? God tells you to do something, do it. And the only thing that will stop you is you. If God is prompting you to get involved with this church, do it. If God is prompting you to do the 10 for 10, do it. You don't have to be the visionary for Shrunny Sam. You know, the apparent project, phenomenal. You know what? Help her with it. Maybe God will give you your own vision. The Bible says what you do for another man, God will do for you. Start supporting other people. So when you need the time of support yourself, you'll have a team behind you when God launches your own vision. that guy that says, oh, hey, I got a great idea. Let's do this for the church. Let's do this for everybody. And then, then they're going to look at me and like, we never saw you anywhere. Why would I get behind you? It's about relationships. I don't want to get to heaven and say, thanks, Jesus, for dying on the cross, but I didn't do nothing for you on earth. What would he say to me? He will still love me. I wasn't raised that way. Am I a contributor or a consumer? Consumers always are empty. 
Day 14 says, <coughs> whose ideal was that? When you look at the miracles in the Bible, you see two themes emerge. Many mir biblical miracles were the person's own initiative, not God's idea. Take the bread and make the sandwiches. Did not come from a lightning bolt from the sky. <laughs> Go to Haiti and help set up a bakery. Did not come from a lightning bolt from the sky. Buy a house, even though you don't have any furniture, because I got some of my kids that are addicts that need your help. And by you helping them, I'm going to help you. A person's own initiative, not God's idea. Many biblical miracles involve a person's own natural action, not just God's supernatural intervention. When your natural collides with God's super, the book says that sparks will fly. Church, sparks are flying. 900 sandwiches this week. 120 meals served at shelters. The love of Jesus spread throughout the city. A new building on the horizon. Love and smiles when you walk in the sanctuary. Well, we didn't have a praise and worship team, so we just put music up there and two brave women got up and started singing. Awesome people that are still up there today. God brings in more great people. God wants to do something in your life. The time is now. It says the bottom line is that when it comes to the miracles you want to see in and through your life, you are a miracle. We got two babies in the house that are miracles. Miracles. She's a miracle. She's a miracle. She's a total miracle. going to be dangerous. <laughs> miracle. You're a miracle. You're a miracle. You were a miracle since the day you were born. You're a miracle. Don't let the world tell you you're not a miracle. You won out of the gate when all those millions of sperm cells couldn't get to your mother's egg. You got there. You're a miracle. God says you're a miracle. Say it, I'm a miracle. Say it louder, I'm a miracle. Say it as loud as you can say it, I'm a miracle. Not that loud. But if this little champion ever finds out from this world that she's not a miracle, and then her thoughts will go above God's thoughts. And we got to make sure that that doesn't happen for our younger generation. We got to get back into the schools. We got to hit the streets. We got to take the initiative. Let me tell you something, church. Sparks are about ready to fly through this family. And it's going to take your participation. It says we're stuck in the ordinary. We want to see God do miraculous things through us. Who do we think that would develop some skills? I love what my wife's doing. She's taking an online class with Sarita Jenks right now. Developing skills. I respect that. She was up till 2 in the morning. Her and I, we haven't been to college in 15 years. You can never stop. How many? You never stop learning. You never stop studying. It's 23 years. See, I was in. But God, your life isn't. See, those two angels' life right now is it stands today that are both under a couple months old. Their life is an empty canvas that God will hold up when they get to heaven and see how they paint it. What is your canvas going to look like? God, I was worth the price. I was worth the price that you sent your son Jesus to die for me, for the forgiveness of my sins, for the provision of the abundant life. 
Of course God's miracles involve unmistakable power and provision. Otherwise, they wouldn't be miracles. But they also require initiative and involvement. Maybe we could sum it up like this. Without God, you cannot. Say, without God, I cannot. Without God, I cannot. Say it louder. Without God, I cannot. Without you, God will not. Say it. Without me, God will not. Without me, God will not. So tonight I ask you, what's holding you back? It's time to get unstuck. Matthew 21, 21 says, God will only move when you move. Are you ready to move? It says, then Jesus told them, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and don't doubt, you have to be doubtless to harvest. And maybe your mountain is doubt. It says you can do these things like this, like Kylie's doing and like they're doing and like this is doing, and much more. God's just getting started. You can say to this mountain, what's your mountain? Fear? I don't have anything to offer. Anger? Confusion? Lack of resources? Or doubt itself? I want you to write it on this mountain. What is it for you? And it says, if you can even say to this mountain that's holding you back, maybe may you be lifted and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. God wants to do much more in your life. What is the mountain for you? For those of you that are prayer warriors, I'm asking you to start praying in the these mountains that are lodged in their in, in people's lives in the sanctuary will be lifted. And as they put them into this pool of water, it will be removed from their life. What is your mountain? What's holding you back? What's holding you back? Target it. Release it. And receive what God has for you. It's time for this stuff to fall off of you. The mountains have to be moved. And as we sing this song, I'll be sitting over this pool with my wife, and I'll pray as this, that sheet of paper is released into this water. It will be lifted off of you into the sea of forgetfulness. Please stand and bring your mountains up here. are mountains that have been holding people back since birth, some of them. Our Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and Conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. My Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus. Just conquer the grave. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. Father 
rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the
in your word and in your call. Because you're not a fearful God. We are not your fearful children. We are bold. We are confident. We are soldiers. We press on. Even through doubt. When circumstances want to turn us around, we stay the course. We run the race. Because a life with you is better than anything this world has to offer. And you have proven that over and over and over again. So, Father, tonight we go out boldly, holding on to every promise that you've given us, every blessing that you pour out on us, knowing it's ours to receive. So tonight we receive it, and we walk in every blessing and every truth from you. In the name of Jesus, we declare all this. Amen. You guys are blessed.